Uh, that's really helpful actually because and it's certainly the impression I get when even when I'm reading your stuff from <laughs> from your undergraduate days in Oxford I mean there's some of the essays there I mean they're more sophisticated essays than I could write now even if I was really really trying hard <laughs> um, and they but also looking at the kind of questions that were being asked uh, you to write about and they're, they, they, they're still relevant questions aren't they it, it, it was quite a it was quite an education that really when I, when I when I when I was reading it, I was thinking, "This is this is thorough and good." <laughs> well, uh, and I'd like to just sort of comment on that because we haven't really talked about that. No. Um, as you know, uh, as a teacher and coming from a grammar school, uh, this period after the Se Second World War was a sort of golden age of universities partly because of um, the return of all these servicemen whose in education had been interrupted, par mm. partly because this was the golden age of the grammar school. And so my two most important teachers at Oxford were both at grammar schools, uh, Lois Doft or Ipswich and, and Barry Grammar School, uh, James Campbell and Keith Thomas. And it was a sort of a wonderful period. I mean, when I was at Oxford as an undergraduate, we had AJP Taylor, we had Trevor mm -hmm. Tre Trevor Roper, uh, we had KB McFarlane, we have uh, many others. So, um, and it it was just before the Robbins expansion. So, you were still getting what were considered at that time to be the top one two percent coming there, uh, and they had been taught at their schools, both at the grammar schools and the public schools, by people who had been at Oxbridge. I mean, it's an extraordinary fact. I look at When I look at the school I'd been at before Sedba, every single master at Sedba School, some remote Yorkshire school, every single master had been either at Oxford or Cambridge, mm. or one had been at Paris. He was a teacher of French. So they were people who had been taught their discipline, history, English, whatever it was, at uh, Oxford and Cambridge before the war and just after the war. And they could, in other times, have gone on to become Oxbridge Dons, but um, they actually stayed there. I mean, I came across another case recently, the new Vice Provost of Kings, Robin Osborne, was taught at Colchester Grammar School, which was a very good grammar school. And his history master, Arthur, Arthur Brown, uh, who uh, excited him and made him later professor of classics at Cambridge University and future vice provost. His history master, Arthur Brown, uh, was one of the main uh, people behind the Essex Record Office and the publishing of documents. Uh, he wrote about local records, and when he retired from being a grammar school master, he became a lecturer at Essex University. I mean, he could have done that long uh, before that. So th when I went there, there were these superb people. Another feature of them was they weren't much older than us. Mm. I mean, uh, because of this interruption hiccup. So James Campbell and Keith Thomas, my two main inspirations were only eight years older than me. They were sort of older brothers. So there wasn't a big gap. And even people like uh, Harry Pitt, my other great teacher. But that didn't really matter because another inspiration was Lady Rosalind Clay and she was 50 years older than me. She <laughs> was in her 70s. She'd been married before the First World War and yet she was a really good teacher. So we had these superb teachers and then we had a superb uh, and no longer quite existing in the same way a structure of education still the medieval tutorial apprenticeship system whereby you would go each week as one person or two people at the most in front of one of these people they would suggest a, a topic give you some reading send you away for a week come back and then you had to entertain, amuse and interest them for an hour. Now, if you wrote boring um, and uh, s 
slipshod and uh, illogical stuff. It wasn't a pleasant hour. They would become increasingly fidgety or if with some of them, they would just interrupt and say, this is nonsense. I'm not going to listen to this rubbish. Uh, write something decent and come back in a week's time. And you respected them. You wanted to please them. You wanted them to like what you did, not because it would get you a good result in your finals, but because they were role models for you. You'd spent your whole life in education coming up to this point. And these people, were, had, you had been told, you'd read some of their stuff when you were even at school, you know, the gentry controversy of Travaropa and Tawney and so on. And here they were, and they were teaching you. So you really wanted to, I mean, it was, they were like going to be coached by Andy Murray. You know, you'd, you'd seen them on Wimbledon and here they were. I mean, that had happened even from the Dragon School. They, they, some of the cricketers, David Shepherd, who taught me cricket at the Dragon School and who was one of the greatest English batsmen, yeah. he was te teaching me cr cricket at the Dragon School. Yeah. And so it went on to university. So these people were sitting there for an hour listening to you. And then at the end of the hour, or at least towards the end, they would say, OK, Alan, that's good in parts but this is wrong and you could do better how about that how about that gradually as you know someone teaching you the piano or pottery gradually explaining how it could be better that went on for three years the other bits the lectures by famous people or even seminars were supplementary and useful but that wasn't the core of it and by the end of it if I look at my essays, if I can't remember whether I put in essays from the first and then second and third years, the quality of the essays, you know, when I went, I realized that when I went to Oxford at the age of 18, I was still a child. I was sort of half a child and half a, a grown up. By the end of three years, I was almost grown up. I mean, I had matured. I was still a late developer. And that meant that I didn't get a first. The, the people who got firsts around me were people who were either come back from national service or they were either because of their family background or for some other reason, they were fully mature and adult. I was still partly child. And therefore some of my stuff was naive and, and uh, illogical and so on. But there was a, a real climb it was almost an exponential. So if I look at the essays in my last two terms and those in my first two terms, I've really made a huge leap. And as um, I was discussing with Sarah, we, we were thinking another thing, which is that um, if you look at the lives of people like Tocqueville, Montesquieu, Adam Smith, and so on, a pattern that emerges is that their, the foundation of their thought lies in the period between about the age of 18 and 30. That is the key period. They've stopped being children and receiving the wisdom. This is the, as it were, the period of Descartes in, in when he leaves university and then goes back and writes the, his great work. It's the period of Einstein. It's a period when You've learned tools of your trade as a, in your primary education and secondary education. And then you have a period when your mind is at its best and most active and hasn't settled down into various grooves. And if you look, for example, at Tocqueville's um, great work on America, he'd already sketched it out in his mind before he went to America, which was criticism of him. If you look at uh, Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, the key idea, which is that wealth will grow unless it's impeded by certain things, that is in a lecture he gave in his 20s. Um, and you would find the same seeds, I think, in all the great thinkers. Um, and the rest of your life is really just working out the implications of that insight. So that period between 80, 18 and 30, which is what I'm dealing with now, 
the mm -hmm. going to Cambridge <clears throat> is absolutely key. And the pivot and the turning point for me was Oxford, both undergraduate and postgraduate, because the postgraduate was another exponential rise, not in uh, thinking um, in a new way, but in methodologies, learning how to do research, how to find new evidence and how to put it together and how to write at length and so on. So those six years were really absolutely key. And often, um, to, to conclude on that, often I can see this now because uh, recently when I wrote the third volume of my intellectual autobiography, um, which um, actually is now going to be absorbed into our book probably, but I took um, various themes in my life and I looked at you know, English individualism or Japan or uh, visual anthropology. And I wrote, you know, 1978, English individualism, also 1977. And then I saw how this theme played on through my life. But nearly always when I started the account, I said, well, this idea really occurred to me in an essay as an undergraduate. Mm. I mean, to take one example, the, the Savage Wars of Peace, oh, which is about the Malthusian problem of why there was a breakthrough in the West. My book on tea, um, which is part of it, you know, the, the strange counter Malthusian tendency of the 18th century. That question was set for me in an essay on what are the roots of the Industrial Revolution, mm -hmm. which I did in my third year as an undergraduate at Oxford. And I found the wonderful thing, and that was the last thing, which is that when you're at school and when you start at university, you think, well, of course, everyone, someone knows the answer to this. They're setting me a question of why was there a Renaissance, which was another example, because that was a question in my, in my sixth form. And I only solved it you know, many years later with my book on glass. Um, so my masters and teachers would set me a question of why was there a Renaissance? Why was the Industrial Revolution, et cetera, et cetera. And I think, well, you know, they're just playing with me, really, because they know what the answer is, but I've got to find it for myself. But what I discovered in the case of the Industrial Revolution, perhaps for the first time and most forcefully, no one knew. Mm. You know, there were 12 thinkers who said it, it was fertility uh, rising. There were 12 thinkers who said it was mortality falling. And there was no agreement. The big questions have not been answered yet. Yeah. And that is a, you know, a shattering discovery for a, a, a young thinker. Um, there's still much to explore, most things. And indeed, the bigger the question, this was some law, you know, the bigger the question, the less chance there is that anyone has solved it. You know, the little ones, you know, like why did they build a canal between why did they build a railway between Liverpool and Manchester first rather than somewhere else? Well, there are probably good reasons for that, which we know. But why was this steam engine invented? How, how was it? Why was it in England? Now, that question. Why was it in England and not in China that the steam engine was invented? Because they had much of the chemistry and science that you needed for invention of a steam engine. Or yeah, I mean, you, 